Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. Cannabis Common Sense is a production of our political committee, the Campaign for the Restoration and Regulation of Hemp. And we're circulating this petition, the Oregon Cannabis Tax Act. I would now like to introduce our attorney, our chief petitioner, my fellow chief petitioner actually, the treasurer of our political committee, uh, and the president of the Oregon Wildlife Federation, Mr. Paul Loney. Well, thanks, Paul. Um, and that's Paul Stanford, if you haven't guessed yet. Um, but the uh, Campaign for the Restoration and Regulation of Hemp, we have an initiative out there which Paul is displaying proudly. It's the Oregon Cannabis Tax Act. Um, this initiative is a comprehensive uh, regulation of marijuana. It will allow uh, medical patients to purchase uh, marijuana at cost in pharmacies with a prescription from a doctor. It would allow our farmers to grow industrial hemp, the low THC variety, and it will allow um, recreational uh, cannabis to be sold for profit at state liquor stores with the money going into our state coffers to lower all of our tax rates, of course. And part of the proceeds will then go into funding real drug education programs and real substance abuse programs. Um, yeah, for the alcoholics and addicts that need help. And you know, currently, 90% of the alcoholics who seek treatment can't get it. They're turned away. So we'll fund that with <coughs> millions, maybe tens of millions of dollars. It's real hard to quantify what the black market will do. But we need your help to put this important issue on the ballot. Right now, as we're taping in early April, we have about 24,000 signatures. We need at least 50,000 more, really a good segment more than that, no later than the end of June. So if you're one of the people who's been watching this show for over a year now that it's been on and you've received our petitions or you have them, send them back in to us right away. If you need petitions, call us at 503-235-4606. If you're inside the Portland area, just 235-4606 because we want to send you these petitions. We need them back no later than the end of June. Uh, that's right. We need those petitions as soon as possible. If you only have one or two signatures on them, send them back in. Um, in tonight's show, once again, we continue um, to show you parts of our recent journey up to Vancouver, B.C., the marijuana breadbasket of the Pacific Northwest, um, and the leader in the emerging cannabis culture. Um, we will continue with uh, Mark Emery, the founder of Hemp, B.C., and still the publisher of Cannabis Cannaba, Cannabis Canada, the magazine uh, all about the cannabis culture. And we still have, um, let's see, we have, what, what is Mark going to be talking about in this one? Um, he's going to talk about uh, the politics behind the prohibition and other issues regarding what's going on up there in Canada. You know, he's been selling marijuana seeds quite openly. In fact, he's been quoted on the front page with a picture on the Wall Street Journal. Well, actually, it's not a picture in the Wall Street Journal, Paul. It's, well, it's one of those drawings. drawings. That's, yeah. what, that's all they have in the Wall Street Journal. But still, if you're going to get anything in the Wall Street Journal, it's going to be one of those little etch-a-sketch yeah. drawings. Well, just to be perfectly truthful here. Right. It's not a photograph, <laughs> but it's a picture, a line drawing. But it's there in the Wall Street Journal. He's been in Rolling Stone over the past few months. He's been on CNN. Uh, He's been out there, and in fact, he is the world's most famous marijuana smoker. And I've got to say, when I was up there at Hemp, B.C., I got to sample some of the finest in uh, British Columbia's herb. And uh, it's, it's a big tourist draw. He's really cleaned up his neighborhood, too. Yeah, that's the, one of the kind of real encouraging things is that with his cannabis cafe and his retail store and the legal assistance center all being on one block up there in West Hastings, he has turned that block around from being a block full of down on his luck, dirty. Um, Boarded up stores. Yeah, panhandlers everywhere and a lot of hard drug addicts and alcoholics on the street. Now it's, it's, a, it's a bustling, friendly street. That's true. All of his neighbors uh, in the surrounding area support him and, and thank him for building up the area, improving the area, and uh, bringing thousands of tourists streaming right into the the, the edge of Gastown in downtown Vancouver. Yeah, and um, I think it's probably about time to go to the interview. In this part of the interview, uh, he's going to be talking about people who have had to leave the United States because of political pressure, because that they were growers, or because they were outspoken against the government, who had to leave and carried up the strains that were developed 
in California, Oregon, Washington, up to Canada and continued on with their experiments up there. Um, I think it's a quite fascinating process of what happened. And it's just, so I think without further ado, go to the interview. You know, and I could be like some poor bastards that I know who, and my first rate, a, a wonderful man named like Will Smith came up here from Oklahoma and he just got popped back in his own mm -hmm. place. Yeah. And he's in jail for 95 years and he's a... No, 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 no my friend Will Smith got, Will got, got, he had four, uh, 42 plants allegedly, allegedly, and he agreed to go back because they said they wouldn't forfeit his property, which his family still lives in his children and his wife, and he got 20 years for 42 plants. Mm -hmm. And they figure he'll serve about 7 to 10. Oh, how nice. 42 fucking plants. Man, I've tripped over 42 fucking plants in some people's grow rooms. I mean, I've had easily 42 plants in my own grow rooms, and around here you might get $500 to $1,000 fine for that. Mm -hmm. 20 years of a man's life. Can you imagine? There's no society so sick as would do that. And yet there is. It's called yeah, the United States of America. And uh, it's a bad, bad place. And there's thousands of Americans up here who are weed refugees who have fled that. In fact, George Van Patten's up here living now, writing about Canadian grow operations. And so many people have come up here. And it's been great. That's how we got our great pot in the first place. American War Resisters came up here from 1968 yeah. to 1972. And they bought all their best strains with them. They settled in British Columbia. And they gave British Columbia, which had no particular reputation for ever growing any good pot, they gave it a fabulous gene pool to produce the world's greatest pot. And these people stayed, and we continued to cultivate, and the situation got uh, uh, hospitable here, and more so in the courts. And over time, we ended up revolving towards the greatest pot. And of course, a lot of the stuff they sell in Amsterdam is produced out of Seattle, Oregon, and British Columbia. More these days out of British Columbia, because there's more work going on here in the sense of genetics, breeding, crossing. Things are happening so much faster here than in the United States right. because there's We've really... crushed. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, you, hey, money is a great coward. And what happened is the expertise and the money went north. They, yeah. where you were, if you were smart and you wanted to grow pot, this is where you'd grow it. And uh, that's what's happened. So Portland, of course, they've recriminalized marijuana there. Or at least that's been Well, we stopped it. Yeah, that, thank goodness about that. But, yeah, yeah, course, but that would be a terrible backward step. Terrible exactly. backward step for Oregon. That would really place it in the backwaters again, like Oklahoma, where you Texas, where you know it's you're, th you're faced with putting rest in, spending the rest of your life in jail, growing pot. And uh, you know, and why bother? My advice is just come up here. Mm -hmm. You don't need to show people you're American or Canadian. You just need to show them the cash. Mm -hmm. As that Cuba Gooding line goes, show me the money. It's still pretty relevant anywhere. And just get an Asian landlord. They don't bother you. They never ask questions. And they're nice people, and you should, you know, deal with them. The white people are too fucking nosy. They're a pain in the ass. Go with Asians. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's why those white supremacists are wrong right there to pot growers. <laughs> you can't count on whitey to help you out here. They're the people that turn you in. They're calling 911. It's not the Chinese guys. It's not the East Indian guys. They don't want anybody knowing what they're doing either, so they're just going to shut up. Mm -hmm. You know, and everybody's got their own private business, except the white people seem to think that they have a right to be everybody's business, in my opinion. And so you got to go for an Asian landlord. And people have good success with that. I see. Yeah, yeah, we'll you're get some immigrants who see this show. You never know. <laughs> hey, we'll, we'll probably get lots. We get yeah. them all the time. They just show up here, and they you, you, next thing you know, they're acting like Canadians. They're Americans at heart. You can always tell because they're noisy if you give them a chance. But, uh, <laughs> but you tell them just, you know, you remember, if you get caught, yeah, you won't go to jail, but you'll get deported. Remember, you get to go back to America. That's punishment enough, so yes. don't be so American, <laughs> you know. You know, because they tend to be a little more pushy, brassy, you know. Nothing like a New Yorker when you meet them on a holiday. Oh, you can always spot them the loudest course. They look like they never relax. They never went on holiday there. <laughs> so they, but, you know, most Americans actually are pretty good. But, uh, you know, you don't, you, when you're in a foreign country growing pie, you don't really want to draw anybody's attention, if you can avoid it. But, you know, even then, we've got some guys who are American who are going to be deported. We got them out, and they've got a refugee status claim going. We've got the uh, Seuss, who's from Oregon himself who invented Product 19 or developed it, who's a grower here, he's now having refugee hearings today. Really? Yeah, and they've accepted initially his claim that he's a weed refugee, which is what our claim is, that he would face substantial penalties going back to the United States that are unreasonable, cruel, and unusual, which we didn't get here. And that's the basis of a claim. Because mm -hmm. cultivators don't go to jail here on first or second offense. Yeah. Hmm. It doesn't matter how big a crop is. You know, whereas you know, in America, you're facing 10 years. That could easily be construed as cruel and unusual punishment. Yeah, I know many people. Who yeah. have unfortunately been locked away right now. Yeah, well, our, our send them our way. If, don't let them go to jail for that. America's not worth sticking around for five or ten years in prison. You know, being a guest of the United States government in that situation, it's worth deciding to look for greener pastures. Mm -hmm. And they're here. Mm -hmm. So, is there any um, 
Any backlash at all you see for anybody talking about, you know, weed immigrants coming up to Vancouver? Nope. Never had a single complaint from the really? public. I've never had a letter, Sorry. never seen a letter, never seen a letter in the newspaper, never seen any kind of criticism about marijuana, basically, from the general public at all. You know, the people you see criticism from are always cops. They're always trying to spread mm -hmm. some bizarre propaganda because it props up their own industry. And the urine testing people, you know, the people who are these counselors, are the world's plagued with counselors, drug abuse <laughs> counselors, who say, I see marijuana addicts every day in my office. I'm thinking, yeah. But it's like the Rape Crisis Council. All you see is rape victims all day. But hey, not everybody works the way you do. We don't just all <laughs> see victims all day long. Right. The rest of us are out in the real world where we've got thousands of people with no dependency problems. <laughs> they don't abuse people. They're not harmed. So in the general public, you tend to meet 99% of the public knows how to conduct themselves properly. And then 1% doesn't. And that's who these people see. They mm -hmm. see the people who couldn't handle reality. And they end up with you, alcoholic, heroin users whatever. I mean, any guy who goes in and says, I'm addicted to pot, he's really looking for a rationalization. Because <laughs> why? What do you do? Well, I don't get up. Well, you're a fucking lazy son of a bitch. So stop smoking pot and get to work. Right? End of right. story, right? right? He's not addicted. He's just fucking lazy. He was lazy before he smoked pot. He was lazy when he smoked pot. And he'll be a lazy fuck after he quits pot, too. Mm -hmm. You know? But that's, they blame pot because, you know, it's like parents. You know, who when they then their teenagers, it's not my son anymore, he's changed, he's hanging around with hippie chicks and smoking pot and going to dissenting movies and rallies and he's not the kid I took fishing and yeah, well what you have is he grew up and now he's on his own and you don't like it, so you're blaming all the peripherals, you know. It could be vegetarianism, it could be nudism, it could be marijuana, whatever he's doing that you don't know, that you didn't do rather, that's affecting his you know, that's a symptom, symptom of his new way of living, you're gonna blame that, not your son. It's not he's not changing or anything, you know. He's not becoming an adult and making his own mind up, you know. It's the drugs, you know, or something like that, whatever. Or, you know, the most common one with my mom was blaming my girlfriend. He was such a nice boy until he started going with all those women. They changed him, right? <laughs> whatever. You know, marijuana is just a popular scapegoat for a lot of people. I always laugh when I hear that because, I mean, invariably it's some drug counselor guy. Well, I see victims of marijuana. Yeah, well, what are you? You're probably a former alk yourself, isn't that right? <laughs> yeah, and I said, well, what are you doing with your living? So you parlayed your alcoholism into a life, like career opportunity. Well, that's really interesting. Sounds like a cop. You know, go around and morally lecture people, and if they don't listen to you, you crack their skull and you get paid for it. I said, that's very interesting. I said, you have the problem, but we're made to pay. You know, and then you get to lecture us about our supposed problem, which nobody said we have one, but you're clearly unable to handle yourself, so you've got a job as a counselor because you've got lots of experience being a dick. You know? <laughs> anyway, the world's full of people making a paycheck on something wrong. Yeah. Well, I'd like to ask, the, is there any part of Vancouver area that, you know, the weed refugees are moving to or, or well, taking over like you tend to be an East Van because every third mm -hmm. house is a grow up there. <laughs> or a South Van is a little more expensive and a better place to be because it's more residential. But then, see, the problem is to have a grow up in a lot of places, you've got to look like you're normal. You know, you've got to show up. You got to be sweet to your neighbors. You got to sort of hang out. It'd be great if you had kids living there. That's a good cover. But you know, <laughs> bottom line is you tend not to. The house tends to be all one big fucking grow operation that you've rented out, and you don't really want people coming around. You don't want to see them. So it's a bit of an art, you know. But fortunately, you know, be grateful we don't get all the government we pay for, as Will Rogers said, because they'd have more cops. Mm -hmm. And basically, the cops can't keep up, even if they bust someone every fucking day in the Lower Mainland. They certainly do. That's peanuts. They might get, you know, maybe in all of the lower mainland they get like a thousand grow operations. Well, there's at least 100, 125,000 grow operations in the whole lower mainland. It's like way beyond what they can. They'll never catch them all. And, it, you know, they keep raising the threshold. Well, if it's under 20 plants, we can't bother with it. If it's under 30 plants, we can't bother. Well, now it's, it's under like 100 plants, we can't bother with it because we know hundreds of places that have more than 100 plants. And like, you know, they stack them up and they keep <laughs> whittling them down and the threshold keeps rising. And basically the way to defeat this is that more and more people have got to grow pot. Don't worry about whether it's illegal. Don't worry about what's going to happen. Grow more pot because you're forcing the threshold up. If a whole bunch of people start growing 25, 50 plants, then, you know, it's got to be like 200 plants are over yeah. to make it worth their while, right? So you're, it's your own protection just by forcing the numbers up. Get that pot out there, you know? And of course, the All right, and we're back. Uh, back to remind you that this interview is brought to you by the Campaign for the Restoration and Regulation of Hemp. Um, and we have an initiative out there that we need your help on. The Oregon Cannabis Tax Act, which will allow adults to grow their own marijuana. It will tax the sale of marijuana to adults through state liquor stores, license bars and taverns to sell marijuana to adults. will allow doctors to prescribe marijuana to patients and allow farmers to cultivate industrial hemp. 
to produce paper, fabric, protein, and oil. We want to send you this petition, so call us right now if you're registered to vote in Oregon or an Oregon resident. Call us at 503-235-4606. That's 503-235-4606. Yeah, call us and uh, we need your help getting signatures. If you already have the initiative and got a couple signatures on it, send it on back in. Um, we need them soon. End of June is the drop dead deadline. Um, if we get enough signatures, get on the ballot, get the pass, maybe we can start improving genetics here. Like Mark Emery set up in Vancouver um, up there. Now they're like part of the world's leader in the genetic, genetic experiments on um, hemp and cannabis. Well, that's where Oregon used to be and we want to be back there. So if you can give us a call, um, put this on the ballot and it passes, we can be back in that boat. We're talking about a real economic boom, I think. You know, the tourist industry is going to boom, the farmers are going to boom. There's just tons of economic potential here that we can channel with the Oregon Cannabis Tax Act. Well, a lot of good, um, I think, the old-fashioned mom-and-pop businesses will come out of this. And I think it's, you know, if we have this um, regulated here in Oregon, we can, where we can have stores, we can have cafes, and a lot of small businesses will come out of it that people who don't want to work for the big corporations or the government or whatever can actually get behind this and um, and you know make a money off it at the same time supporting supporting the government and right we'll raise hundreds of millions of dollars in tax revenue for the state which means less tax dollars mm -hmm. that they'll need from the rest of us Correct. so help us with the Oregon Cannabis Tax Act Call us at right now to get our petition at 235-4606. If you're outside the Portland area, that's 503-235-4606. If you're one of those people with access to the internet, check out our website at http colon slash slash www.crrh.org. Yeah, and um, check out the webpage, give us a call. Uh, if you call during business hours, Usually Bruce will be there to, uh, to help you answer any questions all about the initiative. If you're not quite sure how to fill it out, call us up and we'll let you know. And we send you a package in the mail. We usually have instructions, but sometimes, you know, those are, sometimes those aren't as clear as they should be. But, so, but if you talk if you to a human, help, call us. Yeah, and we'll be happy to, to walk you through it and at least get your name on the, on the initiative. And if you can then you can go out and get one or two of your friends. Um, we need everybody to get as many signatures as possible. Call 235-4606. Don't delay, do it right now. And we're going to cut back to this uh, wonderful interview with Mark Emery. Uh, we went up to Vancouver, British Columbia, and spoke with him. You've got to admit that Mark Emery tells it like it is and, and puts his opinions out there. So back to that interview. All right. You know? And of course, the Americans are always really good. They buy up everything, you know. And people say, well, what happens when everybody's growing pot and we can't get rid of it? I said, it'll never happen. Because there's always America. And America has an endless appetite for things that they shouldn't have, can't get, or whatever, you know. America's just an endless appetite. You could never build enough casinos. You could never have enough drugs for America. You could never have enough marijuana for America. You could never have enough French fries for America. There's just a lot of things in America you could never give them enough of. So to me, America's just one endless place to put pot, it, when they'll always have lots of American money. You know, because pot's a universal commodity, everybody wants it, it's saleable everywhere. You know, before prohibition, before America made marijuana illegal, you know, you could get pot in maybe three or four places in the world, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and it was exported to the world from there for the few people that wanted it. When it was made illegal in Canada in 1923, there's no known record of everybody ever having smoked pot. There, no one's ever written about it, no one's ever been recorded, no one's made any testimony, there's no evidence that it was ever grown here for marijuana, it was grown for hemp all over the place, right? right. And, but nobody grew it for pot. Well, then, then they made it illegal, now it grows in every village, every hamlet, every city, every town. I know a guy growing north of the Arctic Circle in Frobisher Bay with 2,000 watts of light, <laughs> and he has an RCMP visit every three months. He's got to take it all down. And the, guys, <laughs> the whole growth thing is timed cyclically to match that RCMP visit so he can take it all down, put it away, put it back up when he goes. I mean, we've got guys growing in the most inhospitable environment on Earth, as well as every other country, nation, province, place on Earth. They're growing pot. 
thanks to America's prohibition. So one thing's for sure. If <laughs> I already found a few plants in the it, Antarctic. If it, well, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. I mean, after all, why not? That sun there would be great. That'd be an excellent dude. Well, it was, when it was the ozone indoors. layer is deteriorating, then you put that pot into there, because it will thrive. And it will, of course, replace the ozone layer that's lost by adding more carbon dioxide, or sorry, right. more oxygen to the environment, and giving it, you know, excellent, excellent thing to grow under when you've got ozone depletion. Just grow endless yeah. amounts of marijuana. And uh, that will begin to reverse the cycle. And, uh, but now pot grows everywhere. Every place in the world has pot. Every street on Vancouver has five to 25 grow operations. Cops will tell you they can go down the street and tell you about every third one, which is a grow op. They know them. They can't even get the time to bust them, right? In some rural areas around British Columbia, they're not even doing that. There's cops that say, listen, your landlord says you grow growing pot. you got to have it done by tomorrow. I'm coming by. Right? So that means you got to rip it all out and take it. And it comes by, okay. It maybe doesn't come by. He calls up and says, did you rip it down? Yeah, okay. You know, because he doesn't really want to bother you, but on the other hand, he knows it exists, so he's mm -hmm. calling you. Now, of course, that's actually unconstitutional, because that constitutes a fishing act, but you just call me in the phone book and say, we know you've got pot in there, and like, one out of, ten, one out of five people go, Jesus Christ, you know? That'd be kind of a good April Fool's joke, you know? <laughs> this is Officer McGillicotty here, and, uh, you know, actually it would be a sadistic April Fool's joke. Yeah, um, I, would, I don't recommend that. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> Especially if they got Vista 2000, they say who it is, call him, your ass is grass, man. <laughs> We're going to get you. Anyway, I'm surprised more of that doesn't go on. There's a wonderful song by Sublime called Oaks Crazy Fools. And it's about uh, putting a bullet in the people that call 911 to turn us in. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an interesting thing worth considering to one degree. I said, because there's nothing more evil than someone in a so-called free society who turn you in at the risk of going to jail for five or ten years over a gardening project. You should be deal with those people harshly. So, uh, you know, I have certainly no sympathy for informers and people that drop dying, you know, and mm -hmm. cause great untold misery. Those people should be dealt with harshly, and I certainly advocate, you know, a little private vigilante American cell justice for those people. And, you know, others involved in the drive. I'm always amazed nobody with a rocket launcher brings these helicopters down, as if mm -hmm. you're not going to find you. That helicopter's coming down, it'll be hours before they comb the air and look for some guy with a rocket launcher in his mm -hmm. hand. So, I don't know, I, I'm amazed. You know, where are all these militia guys when you need them? Yeah. What the fuck are you waiting for? You've <laughs> got a police state, blow those fuckers out of the sky. You know, you've got all the arms and everything. What the hell are we waiting for? Be a hero now. You know, you'll be 20 million Americans will silently think, thank your praises. I mean, that's what else do you want out of living? You're, you know, these military <laughs> martial guys get in there and raise some shit. Take down the what needs to be done. The U.S. military, do them in. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a big enough challenge for those guys. They're, they're like Rambo. They, yeah, they're I'm a tough they guy. Like. I'm a tough guy. I've got all these weapons, right? Well, get to fucking work. <laughs> you know. America's out there and it needs to be destroyed. Now get to it. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Said you get guys with fertilizer bombs blowing up FBI headquarters. Good idea originally. But then there's people and kids there. Like, what's that? Well, you, you couldn't have waited until there was a big staff meeting or something? You know, I mean, what was the problem there? I mean, stupid, you know, mass, you know, justice seekers like that. America needs a training course on how to properly execute government officials. And you can always edit this later, of course. It's just the humorous, we, you know, we might uh, outtakes. It, okay, there you go. We're, we're the radical frame. I don't know. It makes you wonder. You know, you've had helicopters over Humboldt County for what, 20 years, and nobody's decided that they wanted to test, test out all that surplus they brought back from NAM. Come on. Well, the only time I ever heard of them doing a, a helicopter was in the Oregon Coast Range, and it was they were spraying herbicides for the new forest to help the new trees grow up, and that was making people sick. And also, of course, they had little grow up in the woods at that time there, but they actually blew up one helicopter on a pad at that time. Uh, good for them. So On a pad, that's good, safe, prevents yeah. Yeah. Nobody dies, no you know. That's right, yeah. you know, they did it uh, nice and professionally. Yeah, no, see, there should be more of that. I don't, you know, I don't understand what happened to proper, you know, green revolutionaries. And then you have it like the IRA, you have on one hand political guys like us advocating in the public, and then you have a, a bunch of crazed guys who will blow up anything government owned that's dealing with, that's attacking the marijuana industry. And then, you know, you have them totally paranoid on one hand, you know, they could die at any moment, and then on the other hand, you've got smooth talkers like me trying to negotiate in the public realm with a little bit of help from our armed buddies out there. You know? <laughs> I mean, nobody would be listening to that uh, Sheen Finn guy now if he, they weren't like blasting people's kneecaps for the last 20 years. I think people want to end that, right? So uh, the American government understands they're in a war when they fight back, because I notice you guys lose when you have a determined opponent, um, <laughs> like in Vietnam and, you know, and where, who else has kicked your ass lately? You know, it's only, you know, you, you, lately America's been really good on guys like Iraq, you know, like real, only brought into the 20th century about a decade ago. So, you know, but they lost again. You know, so I'm thinking, I think in America, somebody that could be beaten because the rot from within is so extensive. Mm -hmm. You know, actually, I'm just mm -hmm. giving you a hard time. Don't worry about That's it. That's okay. Yeah. That's good. We're riffing now. This is just the outtake for your party. <laughs> 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 hey, let, let's, hey, Emery said some funny things here. Let's get, let's show yeah. you this stuff. Now we're gonna put that out there so those radicals can okay, take heart. <laughs> yeah, but you might lose your cable access.
Rick Emery is brought to you by the Campaign for the Restoration and Regulation of Hemp. The sponsors are the Oregon Cannabis Tax Act, which is in Paul's hands. Yes, the Oregon Cannabis Tax Act will tax and regulate the sale of marijuana to adults. It will allow adults to grow their own. It will allow farmers to cultivate marijuana for sales through liquor stores and bars and taverns. It will also allow medical patients to have access to marijuana at cost where uh, marijuana sold to adults will be taxed. It will uh, also allow farmers to cultivate hemp for paper, fabric, protein, oil, and just tons of things. Yeah, it's, it's a great thing. I mean, that's a fabulous interview with, with Mark Emery. Um, he tells it like he sees it, doesn't he? Exactly. I mean, he's just a, um, a visionary. Um, and he's had a lot of success up there in, Van in Vancouver, B.C. And um, it's time for us here to, to put our vision into action. And give us a call at 503-235-4606. That's 503-235-4606. And let us send you these petitions and have you fill them out. If you have any questions, give us a call. And if you have petitions, they're already filled out or with a few signatures, send them back as soon as possible. Um, end of June's coming before you know it. And it's always one of those things like, oh, gee, here it is July and I forgot to send them in. I'm, you, know, every, you know, that always happens every campaign. And I sure hope we don't get calls in the middle of July saying, oh, I had a couple thousand, which would have put us over the top. Boy, I didn't send them in, so please send them in today. Um, don't forget. Exactly. You know, uh, our campaign to date has been almost entirely volunteer, but now we are actually paying petitioners. So if you need work or you know someone who needs work, call us at 503-235-4606. We're paying petitioners now. However, if you want to help us as a volunteer, please do. Paul and I are both volunteers. We donate our time and talents and money to help this cause, but a lot of people can't do that. A lot of people have to be reimbursed for their expenses and their time. So if you need to be a paid petitioner, call us right now at 503-235-4606, or if you're a volunteer, call us there. Send yeah. them back, though. Send them yeah. out if well, you Well, definitely, um, you know, we need volunteers because, um, you know, who knows how long before the money well dries up and we can't pay people. Um, you know, right now, you know, we're fortunate. We can pay a few folks. However, we still need, we're probably going to end up with a majority of our signatures being volunteer. That's just, this is the way it's going to happen. And so we need yours. Um, and don't feel, don't think that it's because we're paying a few folks for the moment. We don't need your one or two signatures. We do. We really, really do. So please give us a call. Send back petitions. 503-235-4606. It's 503-235-4606, um, and it, what can I say? Just Get send those petitions, petitions back. back. Send them back in because we need them. Uh, if you send them back right away, we'll mail you new petitions. You know, we've got a new petition format, so dial that number. In closing, I'd like to say that if you live in inner southeast Portland or inner northeast Portland and you're in House District 14, I'm running as a Democrat. The Democratic primary is on May 19th, which is coming up any day now. And if you are registered as a Democrat or you're not registered with the party as an independent, vote for me, D. Paul Stanford, in the Democratic primary on May 19th. Thanks, folks, and uh, we'll see you next time. Get the Oregon Cannabis Tax.